So today, I keep pressing F5. In a web browser, F5 does nothing. What, what, nothing good. Uh, I'd, I'd like to talk about the halting problem. So it's, uh, so this is the XKCD comic for the halting problem that, why, why does everything halt? Because well, eventually, like, uh, the sun burns out, right? And, uh, I mean, uh, uh, set, set your alarms, because we only got, like, five billion years of sun operation left. And it's, it's going to swell up to, like, this, you know, it'll be in Earth's orbit uh, before that, so. Probably die long before that. Yeah, you know, different universe, different solar systems. So the obvious question is, how do I build a computation where I can still have energy forever? Yeah, we don't we don't know how to get energy forever. Even if you do like like a white dwarf is actually really good because they will burn for trillions of years. Little compact, energy efficient like Prius stars. And uh, but after a few trillion years, your little you know, white dwarf is burnt out, and then uh, and then you're in trouble. So in, in, in practice, every, I mean, uh, we don't know of any way to make computations run forever, which is. Uh, which means everything halts. So, okay, that was a <coughs> good lecture there. It was, uh, that was fun. So, so I, I claim, so, so this is actually, so this is really interesting to mathematicians, right? Uh, and, and in particular, that they're, they're interested in this sort of <coughs> classification of decision problems, right? So, so definition of a decision problem is I, I take some input, I run an algorithm that runs on a finite length of time, and I decide yes or no. So the finite length of time part is the, the halting kind of question. So th there's this interesting, uh, so uh, great lecture, 1928. Uh, Dave Hilbert uh, gives gives this lecture uh, listing like what he thinks are kind of the top ten uh, big open questions in mathematics at the time, and one of them was the Entscheidung problem. Then Entscheidung is decision, and problem is problem. So it was the decision problem. So the question is, uh, does every decision problem, is there an algorithm to answer every possible decision problem? And of course, the natural inclination of mathematicians would be uh, that, that, yes, right? That, that the idea is that you know, we, we should be able to find uh, actually the, you know, it's, it's Germany, it's 19, I guess, I guess he was Austrian, but uh, it's 19, 1928, and uh, uh, the 20s were really kind of like, forward-looking, they were kind of the 90s equivalent, right? That the uh, stock market was going crazy, people were, you know, were, thank goodness the Great War is over. Like, in, in retrospect, the, it seems uh, kind of hubris, uh, but, uh, but that, was, that was where it was. So uh, Dave Hilbert, I mean, his, his uh, wir werden wissen, wir müssen wissen, right? We will know, we, we must know, right? Like this, so we should be able to, to answer, answer these questions, yes or no. So, uh, here, here's a decision problem. Uh, does does it halt? So to to, to make this uh, uh, more specific, we need to put types on these things. So I'm, I'm, I guess we did a bunch of lambdas last time. So so this is really simple, right? It's a bool. It returns a bool and it takes a function. And the idea is, can we write something earlier in here that's going to look at the function and figure out the halt? So re return yes or no. So how would you do this? Run it, sure. So uh, if you run it and it returns, say yes. If you run it and it doesn't return because it never halts, you will never say no. So, so just running it is not a good way to do this because then you don't have an algorithm. Because right? I don't have a finite sequence of steps I can go through to figure out the halts or not. So you can do something, so, so LLVM, the Low Level Virtual Machine, is this beautiful open source compiler infrastructure. It's also huge, but uh, so, so you can check for, so you can do static code analysis, very simple sort of thing. And you can see if, uh, if, if all the execution paths always hit an infinite loop, then it's an infinite loop. And if all the execution paths hit a return statement, then, uh, then it's not an infinite loop. And otherwise, uh, just uh, flip a coin? I don't know. 
because th there are certainly interesting programs where we don't know if they're going to stop or not. So, so uh, what's, a, what's a program that uh, might stop and might not stop that would be interesting? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Might not stop the genocide for the police? I don't know. <laughs> So let's see, uh, th there's a theorem you're trying to prove, like the Goldbach conjecture, right? The 3n plus 1 problem. If you've never seen that, we should, we should try that. That might be in one of the, uh, one of the future lectures. Uh, so so uh, here's a theorem I want to prove. So I wrote a program that just uh, starts uh, enumerating all possible proofs. This is, seems really like a uh, curveball. So, so just, just list all the proofs. And uh, check if each one uh, is a proof of the Goldbach conjecture. If that program halts, you know somewhere there's a proof of the Goldbach conjecture. Uh, who, who, in fact, heck, that, the fact that that program halts is a proof of the Goldbach conjecture. It's not a conjecture anymore. Right. So, so, so uh, uh, to, to try all possible, you know, uh, programs, see if the program solves your problem. If that, uh, uh, if if you enumerate all possible programs and you never find one that solves your problem, your problem can't be solved. Great, you can give up. So, knowing if it halts or not is really powerful. It's actually like over. It's it's OP, right? It's uh, it's too powerful. Because then, if if we had a you know an efficient, especially like an efficient, like realizable halting, then like that would solve everything, which would be great, right? So we're, we're uh, uh, I, I I should say. Uh, don't let our, our coming proof that it's impossible make you give up on it because it would be really powerful. Uh, so so, so the, the problem is in, in practice, like uh, not all paths uh, do an infinite. It's not just an obvious infinite loop, and it's not just an obvious like return. It's going to be thinking about stuff, and if it figures it out, it'll return, and if it doesn't ever figure it out, it'll keep thinking. Right? So th th that, I feel like, is a really hard kind of program to analyze. So, ah, uh, it seems like halting, being able to like uh, decide halting would be too powerful. So, uh, several people simultaneously came up with the idea that we can prove that no such program, uh, no algorithm, can exist to solve the halting problem. So the, 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 the way you prove no algorithm exists is you write an annoying function that makes the program uh, uh, not able to return anything like yes or no. So the, the, this is the subtle part. So my annoying function, it, uh, it returns. It running halt on annoying says it doesn't return. And if returning halt and annoying says it returns, then it doesn't return. Which is what makes it annoying. This feels like a, you met this function in middle school. Does that make sense? Arsh, does it not make sense? Or is it? <laughs> I understand what's going on, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, did, did, did he think that function was annoying? Because I think it's really annoying. I think it's like, you are intentionally making my job harder here. <laughs> right? so, so, so the deal about this function is that like, if, uh, if, these, if, if you had any other combination of return values here, it would be fine. If this was infinite loop, infinite loop, that's an infinite loop. If this was return and return, this would always return. And there's no like breaking the universe like self-reference. That there's a, there is a self-reference kind of surprising. Uh, if I halt, halt. Otherwise, infinite loop. And then the cool part is halt can literally flip a coin and say like you halt, and it's like yes I do. <laughs> or it can say you do not halt, and it says no. Sorry, it's run forever. So, so the weird part is that there, there's actually four combinations of possibilities for the return statement, and three of them are fine. Right? They don't break uh, sort of everything. But then there's this one where, yeah, like, uh, if you say I halt, then I won't. <laughs> and if you say I don't halt, then I will. 
which just seems uh, childish. <laughs> so, so, so the deal is this is exactly like the sort of first order contradictory self-reference that uh, you know Kurgle uh, came up with, right? This is the the, the theorem that says like uh, I can't be proved, which you know there's no there's no stable truth value for that. <clears throat> So what does this mean? Well, uh, I mean, it, so the, there's, there's the diagram. This sort of yes or no question does not have a stable answer. How do you wiggle out of this? That's the important question. So mathematicians hate this, right? This says uh, not every question has a yes or no answer that we can find in a finite sequence of steps. That means give up. We cannot solve mathematics. Mathematicians want to evade that any way they can. So how do you, how, okay. You, uh, you want to wiggle out of this one. How do you do it? Approximations. I, I can always guess. I mean, this, this is always, uh, you know, I get an answer. The answer may not actually be correct. <laughs> But I, you know, I can I can guess, and that'll that'll give me an answer. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't seem. You throw it into a different category and say like this is the category of things we can't solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I I feel like actually so this function is like specifically intentionally annoying. The the question is if if we just avoid the intentionally annoying programs, could we somehow like trim ourselves down to like you know less annoying? So it, in particular, the, there's, there's this self-reference, right? And, uh, and, and that always seems kind of dangerous. Right? So, so, so here it's this sort of like truth recursion with a, a not sign. So, uh, it, 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 I mean, uh, uh, Mathematicians' first knee-jerk response to this is to say, we just need to ban those functions and everything will be fine. Does that seem like that's going to work? It seems like you're going to be banning a lot of functions. Yeah, what do we need to ban in order to make it so you cannot have self-reference like this? And is there much left? Let's say, yeah, I mean, th 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 this really looks, it, it, it's actually not calling itself necessarily, but it totally depends on what cult does. In fact, cult is probably not going to run annoying. I mean, that would, that would literally just be an infinite loop, and then, hey, you know, then, we'd be, then we'd actually be okay. Like, if it never even reaches here, then Hulk can say, yeah, hey, the infinite loop, because, you know, he calls me, and I call him, and we get back and forth. But, uh, but the, the thing is, if, if, Hulk, if Hulk is an algorithm, you clearly can't just run the program, right? That's that's kind of infinite loop whenever the program is infinite loop, so it's no good. <coughs> so, okay, halt, halt is supposed to be based on static analysis. This is actually a real thing compilers do, right? I mean, uh, despite the fact that uh, the halting problem is unsolvable, uh, somewhere in the compiler optimizer, right, it's actually trying to figure out what statements are reachable, and thus it needs to know what is going to return and what isn't. And, and, you know, there are certainly restricted situations of do, which it can do that. Now, he, he, here's where it gets weird, right? If uh, oftentimes the compiler is used to compile the compiler, so if the compiler optimizer is trying to figure out if it can optimize this particular statement, needs to know if that statement is going to return. What if that statement is the compiler optimizer? Right? Shoot. Right. I mean, the, the compiler is not trying to be annoyingly self-referential. But the input data you passed to the compiler was the compiler, and suddenly you're back to self-reference again, right? So, 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 so the deal is, I, I feel like this is sort of the most nakedly annoying kind of self-reference. And, and that, that, I mean, I'm, I'm totally fine with just saying, like, halting problems works except for this able. He, he can just go stand in the corner, right? Uh, but uh, but the, the, the problem is that self-reference kind of occurs in places you don't expect it. Right. So, 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 for example, uh, imagine I'm enumerating proofs because I'm trying to solve the Goldblatt conjecture. Somewhere in one of those proofs is basically a disguised version of me. Right? In fact, anything that's enumerating lists of stuff is eventually going to come across your own like uh, curdle number, right? 
uh, or some, some equivalent. And, and depending on how you interpret the things you're enumerating, then, then suddenly you're back to self-reference, which is a little surprising. So uh, several people have proved the same result using different models of computation. And, and, and these were models that people were pretty, uh, they had some hope about. Right? So, so for example, uh, uh, after you know, Russell's kind of set, can set of all sets that do not contain themselves, mathematicians realized like, you've got to be kind of careful about how you define sets and things. So they came up with a really primitive version of uh, uh, calling functions called lambda calculus. And, uh, and, and basically, like, uh, I, I, can, I can make these things recursive without actually literally, because I mean, mathematicians are clearly scared about recursion because it's so uh, powerful. Uh, but but you, can, you can make these things recursive using the same exact trick that Gödel used uh, last time, where I, I just, you know, I have a number that represents the formula. And then I'm just doing arithmetic on the number, whereas really I'm doing operations in the formula, like running it, uh, uh, checking if it's approved, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, this is a really dense paper. Actually, the, so, so we're stuck here for two hours. I'm, I'm actually tempted to have us break into little groups and then pick one of these to work through the details. Because the, the uh, ah, so it, it's clear that if, if we allow C++, right, uh, functions as arguments, functions that can pass themselves as an argument to something else, you can clearly get into trouble, right? I mean, that's, that's the, I, hopefully that's pretty clear that, uh, that you're in trouble. But the, the question is, is, is there some more restricted version of computation where suddenly we're safe again, right? I mean, it, it, it templates or recursion like seems like, you know, m maybe that's just the thing we, like, maybe functional programming is just the thing we need to ban, right? And, and uh, I'm okay with that. If we're just down to for loops and sort of, you know, honest, simple things, maybe we're okay. Uh, but it, 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 it so, so actually the trick was finding like a restricted model of computation where this still, this still works out. So well, lambda calculus, I, I don't know, have you all seen lambda function? So I can, I can say something like lambda in x, uh, I'm going to do a uh, successor to x. So, so, so the deal is uh, uh, lambda, and, and this is where the C++, uh, like they're called lambda functions because it's the Greek letter lambda uh, using these things. So lambda x, an expression, just means I'm going to apply this expression to some new thing like y. And basically, y is going to substitute for x. This is the way. This is the mechanics for why lambda, the way of lambda functions actually work. So, the paper is not a great intro to this. Uh, so, so, how do we do this? Well, okay, y uh, is now replacing x and all these things. So we now have the successor to y. Right? So, so it's. I mean, it, it's just it's just substitution. That's the the basic idea. Uh, it's surprisingly enough. Uh, one place this gets tricky is what if I already have a y in there? Well, this y is not necessarily the same as that y. So you may so, so figure out how to break the. It, it basically, what you want is you want like uh, functions that take local where the arguments are local variables, and this is kind of most of the work of kind of building stuff with lambda. Uh, but, but the, the weird part about uh, Church's paper is it's, it's a totally mathematical paper, right? It's clearly not like intending for computation to happen. Uh, so uh, Alan Turing heard about Church's paper and uh, sort of rushed out this uh, uh, a paper of his own where he was really writing it unbelievably explicitly, right? Now, now the weird part is this is 1936. So at the moment, I mean, computers are sort of, uh, computer is a job title. Uh, they had uh, automatic computers, like the uh, Brainiac, Moniac, uh, uh, et cetera, and, and the, the ACK part is automatic computer. So they had automatic computers usually reading like paper tape. So, so you'd, you'd have a hole if it's a zero on a you know, uh, paper if it was a one. So you'd write your programs using a hole punch or something, and, uh, uh, and basically like you can, you can read and write uh, uh, tapes. So uh, to, to Turing, Turing machine is actually kind of a it's a really primitive kind of machine. And, and uh, I, I'm always struck working on Turing machines quite how, how little there is there. So why would we pick a, a, really, a really weak version of computing to try and do proofs on? Because like, if you have C++ uh, 11 in particular, then 
clearly it's powerful enough that I can really easily you know, express complicated things. Yeah, so, 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 so the surprising thing is that the more complicated your machine is, your model of the machine is, then uh, the more work you have to do, right? In other words, it, modern, like C++ is designed to make it really easy for people to write complicated programs, right? So there's all kinds of this machinery like templates and you know, functional metaprogramming, et cetera. And, and, and it's designed to make the user's life easier. If you want to build a mathematical model of C++, right? I, I want to show, for example, that I can emulate C++ on top of some simpler architecture, like x86 machine code. It's also pretty complex. What do I have to do in order to show that like, I can run C++ programs on x86? Show that all C++, all, the set of all C++ programs can actually be thrown in the set of x86 programs. Yeah. So I have to take every language feature in C++ and show how you can implement that in x86 machine code. And then you know, I got to write a C++ compiler. It doesn't have to be an optimizing compiler, but I got to show that it can be uh, it can, it can be compiled. Like that's work. So Turing machine is unbelievably simple and primitive, which is which it, it means that writing programs for a Turing machine is awful. But simulating Turing machines is really easy. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so the, the weird part about this is that uh, yeah, a lot of these machine models are designed to be easy to simulate, not designed to be easy to write programs for. So, for, for in the in the homework that was uh, was going to be due last Friday, but then uh, somebody unplugged the switch that uh, that that. Uh, that the connects basically our whole machine room to the outside world, so net run was not accessible, and I. I most of the timing code, I gave you timing examples on the net run machine, so uh, so that, that homework is actually due uh, at midnight tonight. Was it you guys? <laughs> it's, uh, John Kwan was in their inventory, so uh, so uh, if, if I want to if I want to build it, I, I want to build a simulator because there's stuff I want to measure about the simulator. Uh, how many people wrote an assembler for their, uh, oh, cool, in, in Python? Python. All right. That's right. <laughs> it's like a superpower. <laughs> so, uh, anybody else write an assembler? No. Uh, so you, you just hacked out bare machine code. Yes. That's, that's a lot harder than it is to uh, uh, write C++. How many people wrote a C or C++ or Python runtime? Can it can it run Python? Does it assemble Python into machine code? Because that would no. be bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, why not? Because uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to write programs in Python. That's what Python's designed for. But writing the Python runtime is hard, right? And and it's because you know life sucks, right? If, if I want if, if I want to give some uh, cool new feature like arbitrary precision arithmetic, like Python has built in. I got to express the arbitrary precision arithmetic, which was really easy to use. I got to express it. I got to figure out how we're going to write all the code for the arbitrary precision arithmetic. And if you're a mathematician and you want this proof to be a sort of convincing proof, you got to you got to uh, be sure that everything you're doing in the sort of translation process is right. So, so the, the validation gets a lot harder. I mean, this is. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 so basic idea is that there's there's kind of this trade-off between thinking things from the user side and thinking the things from the runtime, you know, the, the, whatever's underneath the sort of machine interface setup. And and a Turing machine is way, way, way over on the side of like it's totally designed to be easy to simulate Turing machines, and it's just awful to write code for Turing machines. So when you when you write code for Turing machines, you can see like this is awful and I hate it. Then that's good. That's that's fine. The way it works. So. Uh, if I'm going to express this sort of halting problem using Turing machines, I need to have a Turing machine that determines if another Turing machine halts. Well, one of the weird parts about the Turing machine is that it, it, uh, it's not a stored program computer. Because they didn't, okay, this is, remember, uh, John von Neumann is like in, uh, uh, 
in middle school at this time. So, like, they don't have von Neumann machines. Like, programmable machines weren't really, like, on everybody's mind. And, and, and random access memory wasn't really a thing either, right? That most of their storage devices were these linear storage devices. We have to seek back and forth, read some data, seek all the way over here, read some data. And this notion of being able to just jump into memory and grab a thing wasn't, wasn't really there. So, yeah, surprise. So, uh, the t t Turing machine model. Ah, I've had a tape. And then I have a uh, the, the sort of control program. So the, the, the interesting part about this is the control program is like the, the machinery of the computer. And uh, again, this is sort of plug board style programming where it's not really intentionally thinking of the control program as being like a load, like there, there wouldn't be, like nowadays we think of software being loaded onto the control system. But it, it, I mean, this is more like the circuit of the uh, uh, the, the CPU rather than the and, you know the program is somewhere in uh, uh, on the tape perhaps. So so the idea is this is uh, this is finite, and in particular the, the control program basically never changes, right? We you know a Turing machine we wire it up one particular way and that's just the control it uses. The tape if the tape is finite too. This doesn't become mathematically interesting. And uh, wh why not? There's only so many things you can do with it. Yeah, so I mean, if, if my tape only has uh, 2 to the 32 times 8 uh, bits, because there's only 32 gigabytes worth of tape, then this is a finite number. We can only enumerate a finite number of states. That means that no program can really, like, you know, work forever. going to run out of space. Now, leave aside the fact that this is a ridiculous number of states. I mean, really, like, so, so 2 to the 256, like, uh, when, when the military wants to encrypt data, they use a 256-bit secret key, right? AES 256 is uh, OK to en encrypt uh, anything. And, and it's because, like, no adversary that uh, the, the military can imagine wanting American secrets could could ever like figure that out. Which you know, enumerating a space like this is just uh, like forget about it. Uh, but it's it's a finite number. So as as far as uh, math is concerned, it's game over, right? If if I have a finite size tape, uh, is it physically plausible to imagine a arbitrary size tape? I mean, there's, it, it, it's clearly impossible to get your delivery of tape, right? And like, okay, here's the start of the tape. And the end, there is no end. It just keeps going. Like, you, you can't get a tape like that. It doesn't, doesn't work. It just trails off into the darkness somewhere. Uh, what is a physically plausible implementation of a tape of unlimited size? Then it would start repeating. Uh, internet access. Mm -hmm. stuff from the, the cloud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah sure, problems. sure. Yeah. If okay, it's it's the it's the thirties. What's uh, what's the equivalent of the internet? Trains. <laughs> so 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 the, the the idea is like if if you run out of tape, what do you do? Because if it's a finite link tape, you're going to be zooming along, doing your computing, and then you're going to hit the end of the tape, and what, what then? Go more tape? Yeah, you, you will order more tape, right? The railroad will ship you more tape, and you will just, you know, patch it into the existing tape. So, so, like, so, so the idea is, if you're not going to worry about the case where, like, you're out of tape, because, like, we'll just get more tape, there's, you know, we can, we can grow more trees, we can eventually, right, uh, so, so we can fill the entire planet, or all the planets, they can all be filled with tape. We'll be making planets into tape. This is okay. So it uh, so so, uh, so so our dirty link tape zone is that the tape is infinite. Sometimes, if you don't like the term infinite tape, you can call it semi-infinite, which basically means the same thing. <laughs> Maybe call that semi-infinite. This uh, I don't know if uh, if you don't like this, and I don't really like this, then you know you just imagine like virtual tape. 
where we page it off onto the cloud. And then if you need more, you just get more money, right? That's the... Uh. So, uh, so we have a halt determining Turing machine. In other words, this, uh, this Turing machine is wired up to figure out if other Turing machines halt. So th th there's this interesting question, like, uh, it, it is, is this a Turing machine? Because I, I have a little finite control structure that takes as input not just a tape, but an, another Turing machine. So, so, so the hard part about doing this is, like, uh, there's the program I want to analyze, right? And it's a combination of the data and the control. And, 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 and you can... I mean, this line between data and control is totally fungible. I, I don't know if you saw it there in the hallway, there's the Java ring. It's the ring that executes some Java instructions and in hardware. I mean, th th there's this question, like, if I'm, if I, I'm writing Java, it gets compiled to bytecode. That bytecode, right, d d d uh, Java is actually designed for embedded systems, where basically the bytecode would be running on the hardware. But uh, t uh, it, you know, most people have x86s. So they wrote a JVM that reads Java bytecode and writes x86 uh, code. So now you can run your Java, I mean, Java source gets compiled to Java bytecode that gets uh, JVM to x86 machine code. x86 machine code inside the CPU gets turned into micro ops to then actually execute on the thing. So, so like, where you draw the line is totally negotiable, right? Uh, I don't know if you, a uh, trans meta, uh, this, was, this was a company that uh, I think they've been defunct for a number of years now, but uh, th they were trying to make a faster x86 by doing software translation of x86 to micro ops instead of a hardware circuit that translates x86 to micro ops. And they were, they were actually fairly close to making it. I, I don't think they quite made it, but uh, so, so in other words, the, the idea was that they, would, they would write a CPU that looks like it would run x86 programs by taking the program, in software, transforming it into uh, basically these, you know, uh, high-performance risk instructions for their high-performance risk CPU, and uh, they call it code morphing, uh, and and you know, so that's that's totally a thing. So, 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 so there's there's already this really negotiable boundary between my data and my uh, sort of code. So, so you, you can you can draw that line anywhere you want, but basically that's a machine. Now, the hard part about this is I have this sort of so, so here's like the test program. Uh, and then, and, and, and this could be the annoying program. And then I, I'm, I'm going to have my little halt check program, and it's uh, the control is going to look at look at this somehow. So ha, ha, how do you do this, right? I, I want to take the sort of test machine and and the tape and make it so I can feed it into this uh, sort of halting program. So, so the, 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 I mean, this is clearly the, the hard part about doing the mechanics of figuring out how to, how to uh, mathematically describe a program analysis transformation. Right? Is it, I, I, I need to figure out some way to encode the machine as something that another machine can take. And, and again, this is really easy if I'm allowed to pass functions to functions. But uh, how, how do I do this? So, so you could call this a universal Turing machine because it takes other Turing machines as input and then does things on them. And you turn the machine into a tape? Yes, yeah, so, so, so I, I, I need to take the machine and its control and, and somehow make it one big tape, right? So I, I gotta virtualize this whole thing. So I, I just have one, one big tape that represents the control system and the tape. So the, the uh, right, so, so somewhere, uh, it is, I'm going to have a control system for my whole thing uh, uh, program. And I'm going to encode on the tape the, you know, the, the, pr the program I want to test. And, and then it's input. Both of those things. Now, uh, again, the, the equivalent in the sort of functional model here, uh, annoying doesn't take any arguments, but halt takes arguments. Which somehow seems a little, a little weird. If uh, so, if, if I'm writing functions, uh, I have a function that takes an argument, and I want to wrap it in an interface that doesn't take any arguments. How do you, how do you do that? So, 
I write a function that takes no arguments, and then I call the function that takes arguments, passing the arguments I want to pass. Right? This is hopefully it's clear. You don't you don't need to pass separate arguments in functional programming because you know, I, I can I can store things locally. I mean, one of the weird parts here is that uh, the thing I'm passing as an argument is me. Somehow seems. I mean, the, 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 this sort of self-reference. It, it's clearly philosophically dangerous, and uh, the, so, so the, the, this is why uh, we make a big deal out of figuring out exactly how the mechanics of this work out. I, I guess the other weird part about this is people weren't used to thinking of like recursive functions. They were trying to figure out how, how tapes work. And, and uh, one of the really th amazing things to me about this uh, 1936 paper by Turing is the fact that he he's ready to build it. I mean, no one has built like digital computers at the, you know, or, you know automatic computers were kind of a, uh, and in particular, like a general purpose programmable automatic computer was, you know, not, not wasn't really being articulated in many places. So, uh, so, so the idea is I've, I've translated the control unit onto tape. Uh, how, how hard does that sound? So, uh, so what's inside a control unit is I've got uh, a bunch of states. So I'll, I'll be in state A, and then I'll read something off of the tape, like a 1, and then I'll be in state B. And if I read a 0, then I'll be in some other state. And, and, uh, and, and then I can, I can also move left and right on the tape. So yeah, the, the, these, uh, this sort of state machine is going to get appallingly complex. It's got to be a finite state machine. In other words, there's just a finite number of states and finite number of transitions per. So mathematically, how do we simulate a uh, finite state machine? You, you need to build a program to simulate a Turing machine. Occurrence relations? Do, uh, oh gosh. If I wanted to solve the asymptotics of transforming it, use recurrence relations. What, uh, uh, you, you're, so maybe I should make the next homework, like uh, write a Turing machine simulator. How do you represent the Turing machine's control unit? Yeah, so it's a finite state machine. How are you going to, I mean, what, uh, maybe this would be more valuable to just switch to doing this. <laughs> so, so, so you, your simulator has to keep track of what, what stuff you got to keep track of to simulate this uh, this thing. So you got to know like what state you're in. So you got like I got an int that says I'm in state zero is where I start off. And then uh, what do I? So how do I represent this graph of uh, state transitions? Yeah. So, well, so, so, in in code, how do you represent your big graph of like either some sort of a tree or a table or something? Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the uh, so t tree is also so so a, a, a table seems great because I can say like okay, I'm in state zero. I'm going to read something. So, no, somewhere I'm going to have a bunch of tuples, right? If I'm in state zero and I read a so, so then I'll, I'll where I go when I read things, and uh, I'll call that state ten. So I, I, if, if I'm in state 10 and I read a 0, then I'm going to go to state uh, 12, and otherwise I'm going to go to state 15. So I'm going to go to 12 and 15. And maybe I have an array indexed by the stuff on the tape. And uh, well, I, I guess i got to figure out whether I go left or right. So you can, you can do some clever, stupid pack, like positive or negative. Or, or, or I could have uh, uh, basically left and right. There's if I read a zero, I go to state 12 and I move left. If I read a one, I go to state 15 and I move right. Does that, that make sense? So you, you pick some data structure for representing this. And, and you, could, you could do it, uh, I guess you could have more curly races somewhere. So you, you just have a list of these, right? So I'd have a list of states, things I'm going to read. And it's, it's somehow you can index things that are actually the easiest. Okay. I'm changing my mind on what I should do here. So if you read a zero, you go to state 15 and you move left. Right. If you read a one, you go to state twelve. I got those backwards. Uh, so you you read a one, you go to state fifteen, and you move right. So it's something like that. So basically, like I, I look through and figure out what state I'm in, or you index it, and then you say, well, what am I reading? And uh, you know, check check your little list of those things. So it makes sense. 
you have to move, you have, you have to solve how many steps because it's like a mechanical puzzle. So you're jumping and it's almost like thinking of like jumping to a spot in memory. So like a memory address. So surprising thing of a Turing machine, it always reads what's directly under the head. This is the worst part about writing Turing machine programs. Is it, it, it reads the thing it's on, and then it moves one square left or right, which, yeah. So it, it's not easy to write programs for, but it should be, I mean, literally, I, uh, maybe I should just have this build, build one. Uh, so w w we can we can totally write to write a simulator for it. Like I mean, I, uh, hopefully. So, so you notice what we just did here, right? I, I wanted to simulate a Turing machine in C plus plus. So I figured out a data structure to represent the control structure of the the control system of the Turing machine in C plus plus. Like here is just an array. If I write the array onto a tape, and I build a write I write in this awful Turing machine program to like look at the tape and, and simulate the next Turing machine. I've just built a universal Turing machine. It's, it's, it's kind of an interesting meta kind of operation there. Uh, it's really easy with Turing machines because all you do is you do the state transitions and the and, I mean the, the, the tape. So basically, I mean I got an int that stores the state I'm in. I got an int that stores where I am in the tape. I have one array to represent the tape, another array to represent the states. That's it. Like there's, you know, there's nothing to them. Whereas this is a lot harder in like C plus plus or x86. Oh my gosh, getting your little simulated x86 to boot would be a pain. Does this make sense? So, so, so essentially, all we've done is we move from having like a model of an actual machine, right? right and there's the, the think of this as like a bunch of wires and circuits. No, now this is just a data structure, and and the weird part is then I can have another set of wires and circuits that operate on that data structure. So I, I've got uh, I, I've got the halting program. So so here's the control system that determines the halting uh, uh, solves the halting problem, and I've got the, uh, the the Turing machine and then its uh, uh, its output. So, so, so we need to next make the annoy. So, so again, I mean, uh, the uh, the Turing machine is going to like eventually it's going to like be in some state, print yes, and then halt, or it's going to be in some state, print no, and halt. Right. So, so, so th there are going to be state transitions in a halting machine that are going to do this. So, how do we make the annoying Turing machine? So what I want to do, I, I want to feed in a program that's going to break this. That's going to make it say yes if it would have said no and vice versa. So the self-reference part is what we need to take in there. Can you just get two of them pointing at each other? How do you make them? So, 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 so the trick is, uh, one of them has to be on the tape, and one of them has to be in the control unit. And, and they ought to be the same one. <laughs> so so the, the, the mechanics of this basically like is that, uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, it, 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 I actually have this permeable boundary between code and data. So, so I can I can I can move stuff back and forth there, and, and in particular, like what I'm what I'm trying to simulate would be this uh, this sort of new Turing machine that that, that has uh, that has the, the the annoying part built in. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the uh, I'm going to take where it would have said yes, and I'm going to switch it over so it just infinite loops, and where where, where it would have said no, then I'm going to switch it over to where it's uh, it, it falls. No. So, yes, it halts. So don't halt. Nope, never halts. It's a halt. So, 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 so uh, and, and then all I do is I write the same Turing machine onto, so, so there's the control unit. Uh, and what it's running on is, yep, the same thing. That's, that's where I get the self-reference. So write the control unit for the same Turing machine onto the tape Turing machine supposed to analyze. The, 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 this is the weird part of this. So, so the, the gory details of figuring out the uh, the mechanics of doing the self-reference. 
that's that is where it kind of gets philosophically tricky. I, I agree. This is this is confusing. Uh, and uh, Talvi made these slides two years ago, and I have not. Uh, updated but not rewritten this part. And I, I, there's probably some clever way to convey this. So, so, so the idea is the control unit and the, uh, the Turing machine under test are the same thing. The translated versions of each other. And, and this is how we get the self-reference. So, so the weird part about this is that this, this could say yes or no depending on what, uh, what you claim to have done in here, but it can never say something consistent. If it says, yes, this Turing machine halts, then clearly it does not halt. And if it says, no, this Turing machine doesn't halt, then sorry, man, it halts. So there's no way to get the right answer because of the annoying self-reference. And uh, there's no way to forbid the annoying self-reference if you're going to take an arbitrary Turing machine. So, so the trick, in fact, this is sort of the, in philosophy they call this the move, right? So, so the move is kind of the, uh, you know, we're talking about one thing and then we kind of subtly shift, the, the, this, this is, so, so the key operation here is uh, I, I, I can translate any Turing machine into a tape, right? And uh, uh, so, so I, I don't, so. The, the weird part about doing this is like, the obvious way to do soft reference, we have two control units. And, and that's a pain, because then I have to modify the control unit to put in a new control unit. And, and, and then I immediately, like, I, I can't do this kind of feedback self-reference thing because, uh, like, I don't have the original control unit. I need, like, an infinite regressive control units or something. Like, well, what if your control unit, I mean, uh, so the device under test is this thing. So to, to feed this back into itself, I would need another control unit that feeds the whole control unit that feeds the way, but I, I want the same control unit. And you pretty much can't do that with the hard, like a, the circuit can't do the self-reference. But data can do the self-reference. In particular here, like uh, if you ignore the tape, you, you say, okay, I built my, my Turing machine, hand me, a, you know, hand me a tape with anything on it. Then you can say, okay, you built your Turing machine, great. I'm gonna digitize the whole thing, write it onto the tape, and then say, now what you're gonna do Make sense? So, 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 so the, the mechanics of it seem a little bit slippery, but it, it, it totally took so, so, and uh, this is not a one-off thing. It, actually, we're, we're going to do this again. This is, this is like the proof technique that we're going to use the entire semester. I, I want to show some property holds for some wacky model of computation. Well, I figure out some simpler model of computation or some, some different model of computation that I can simulate the, you know, the, uh, the, that law. So in this case, what we're doing is we're simulating a Turing machine control unit using a Turing machine tape. Questions? Stunned silence. Ah, uh, yeah, so self-reference uh, pretty much destroys everything. In fact, you, you can't just say, you know, it, it's, it doesn't work to say, here's my halting program, come at me, bro. This is, uh, I can take anything as an argument. It doesn't work, because you can go back in as an argument pretty easily. Ha, ha, so, uh, who, who cares? Well, uh, mathematicians were pretty much bummed because the answer to the entrapping problem was no. <laughs> Not all problems have a yes or no answer that you can compute using an algorithm. Ah, uh, so so some some people were annoyed enough about this that they say, well, look, so so one of the things we did here is we said assume somebody gave you a uh, Turing machine that halts, like that, 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 that solves the halting problem. Then we show that you know proof by contradiction, right? You say like if you gave me one, here's how I could break it. This seems like a fairly concrete version of it, but uh, I, I don't know. So some some folks, uh, and and uh, it's it's hard to show stuff doesn't exist in the constructionist way. Like I can show that like some you know a, a Turing machine exists to solve this problem because here's the Turing machine that solves the problem. 
I mean, that's, that seems much more valuable to me. But uh, it's, it, it's hard to do, like, uh, there is no Turing machine that solves this problem. Like, you can't, you can't do that without having contradictions, so I, I don't know. Uh, if I write my Turing machine, simulated in JavaScript, simulated JavaScript on top of V8, simulate the V8 on an x86 virtual machine, simulate the x86 virtual machine on a PowerPC virtual machine on an ARM virtual machine on back to x86, etc. as far as you want. It's still self-reference. And if all of the layers are operating properly, you've literally done nothing to the semantics of the program. So you're still in the self-referential feedback loop. So, so, so this, this is not as easy as like just stir compare, like, you know, look in the compile optimizer and see if you're compiling the compiler optimizer. And if so, you're like, no, no. But in the end, it all hits hardware, right? Like you can't really self-reference mm -hmm. hardware. Right? The, well, I, the, 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 the surprising part is you, you, you can self-reference hardware by building a software model of the hardware that runs on the hardware. And, and, and that, that, that's the key kind of move, I feel like, in Turing's proof. The, 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 yeah, you, you can't you can't virtualize hardware. The hardware is the hardware. So instead of building like a second piece of hardware that somehow like says what the first hardware does, you just make a software model of the hardware on the hardware, which is fine. Uh, I I'm somehow excited about this notion of moving beyond truth and falsehood. This thanks what it feels like a very 21st century concept. Like uh, we don't need true or false anymore. Uh, I, I feel like in particular, this, uh, to this case, just like Girdle's proof is a first order oscillator that just goes true, false. And it, it makes me think there's actually probably higher order truth os oscillators that say true, true, false, true, true, false. Like if you're willing to allow, uh, allow that. I, I don't know, I, I always feel like uh, re return a bool, right? Function returns a bool for any C++. It could also just throw. So, you know, if, if you can throw, then all bets are off, right? This is now, and, and, and this, is, this is the annoying part about writing C++ simulators, is you're like, I got it all in C++, I even got templates working, that was a nightmare. And then you're like, oh, I forgot about exceptions. Oh my gosh. And exceptions, exceptions called destructors, and like, oh jeez. There's just all this machinery that makes that work. So if I have to return a bool, well, I could also just, yeah, I, I see like, I, there's no, way I can return true or false. I'm just out of luck here. You throw, and you say like, uh, throw illegal self-reference, and then you're like, my contract is satisfied. Like, I never said I would halt when I wouldn't, I never said I would halt when I won't, so you can, you know, does what it says in the manual, read the contract, it's okay. Uh, but the problem is, somebody can now just like uh, just start up, like if I can statically analyze and be sure that it halts, then I say it halts, and if not, then I say it doesn't. And then that, that, that crazy else case, instead of guessing, I just say, I bet it's self-reference, because that's, because uh, I can't tell, I don't know, <laughs> right? Then how, how does uh, just throwing self-reference, like when, when is it safe to call self, throw self-reference, and when should you not have thrown self-reference? You should give me a real answer. Hard to say. So, w what does the contract look like? You're going to allow this third value. Nobody knows. Uh, I kind of like this notion that uh, if we're mostly true, like it, it's totally okay if, uh, uh, if if you have a non-self-referential program. You could always, you know, there's no theoretical problem with always being able to solve that. And and in fact, uh, compilers are kind of working their way towards being able to do that, which would be cool. Uh, and, and then most of this, most self-referential programs, I guess, uh, you know, at least uh, three out of four, <laughs> if, if you're assuming kind of random uh, uh, return or halt kind of thing, th those are all okay. And most of the, like self-reference is totally fine. Like you know, I'm doing factorial. If it runs down to a base case, that's fine. But you know, self-reference is okay. So calling yourself is okay. I guess the other way I like to think of wiggling out of this is to say like uh, an algorithm has to solve the halting problem. So if we don't have an algorithm, we're okay, right? We can solve the halting problem if we use non-algorithmic solutions. So th there's an obvious way. So algorithms have a fine sequence of steps that can uh, terminate. So if it doesn't terminate, it doesn't have to terminate, again, you just run it. That's great. If it returns and you say, yeah, it holds. 
And if it doesn't, you say, the situation is clear, ask again later. So that's, that's cool. I mean, if it eventually, eventually one of these things has to happen, right? You, and and you, know, you could run the program and start doing proof checking to try and prove to yourself that the program is in, stuck in the loop. And you know, eventually one of those two has to you know, finish. Like either the program is going to halt or you're going to find a proof eventually that it doesn't halt. And event, at some point you're just going to be trying all possible proofs. But, but that, I mean, eventually, it's, it's, I, think it's, I think this is guaranteed to work. Uh, this is this guaranteed to work? What if your program computes all the digits of pi and they never repeat? So, yeah. yeah. So but that, the, 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 this is the annoying thing. It's like it, it could be on an infinite loop that isn't a strict repetition. Yeah. The, the, the things are changing. It's just they're never changing in such a way that they will stop. So. Yeah, it, uh, so I, I, I think one of these three things eventually has to happen. Now, now this is where the, you know, you, you realize that the reason you can't determine if it's uh, stopping or not is because it is you. And and then then you're really sort of reaching. Uh, so I, I don't know. It uh, I, I feel like I feel like self-reference is kind of an interesting challenge, right? That uh, there are probably questions about me that I can't answer. But like, is your answer to the next question no? That that doesn't. That doesn't strike me as the most important kind of self-referential question. Uh, right. So I don't know. Uh, there are problems that you may be asked to solve that are impossible. Because if CSS is turned complete, you can't check CSS statically. Because the, the sufficiently awful CSS could essentially be encoding a model of you. Can't be, can't be done. I suspect that's, it can be done. That's not the way. I mean, you can do math now. So if you can do math, you can Once you can do math, I think it's all over. CSS3, yeah. you can do math. So <laughs> go ahead and make a plan and CSS3. <laughs> not a homework. That's not a suggestion, not a homework. Ah, right. So we, we, we got our hour done. Uh, so I had, uh, there's a bunch of possible paths to self-reference. So uh, the, the little lambda calculus. So with Turing machine, there's this key move. Uh, the hard part is kind of working out the details. How do you have a program answering questions about the program? I, I claim it's, it's almost too easy with uh, uh, lambda. My vision was we break up into a groups of two to three. Pick one of these or you know, pick a new one. Uh, actually, like, uh, so, so in particular, it should be possible to write a simulator. So uh, one of the paths is your homework zero machines. So it, in particular, it should be possible to write software for the machine that actually models the execution of the machine. And as soon as you can do that, you can make uh, self-contradictory self-reference. Uh, virtually none of these people have, uh, so, so to Turing machine is actually, so, so the beautiful part about this paper is that uh, the, the model of computation with a Turing machine is so incredibly simple that it's actually pretty easy to show the exact details of how you transform a program to be self -reference. And and, uh, and and that wasn't the case with so, so for example I mean Kirtle uh, kind of waves his hands and says like uh, well <clears throat> okay by doing operations on numbers unspecified operations we can check to see if the number is a valid proof like I don't think I've ever seen somebody work out all the detail like you know mechan mechanistic proof checking is a thing but uh, mechanistic proof checking that we check the uh, the thing is, uh, is is not something. That you so, but for some reason, Monday noon. I, I should have announced it better. I remembered as I was getting <laughs> off the bus. Totally, totally cool. <laughs> so, uh, w w which of these sounds promising? Do, do any of these sound interesting? 
so, so uh, what, what one way is like yeah, write a Turing machine simulator, and and then at, at least sketch out how you could build a universal Turing machine in the Turing machine simulator. Yeah. I, I I also feel like uh, there's actually kind of a missing. Uh, so if, if we could figure out some some really easy way to represent some some very efficient compact representation for uh, uh, arbitrary computation uh, that, that includes random access sort of the more updated Turing machine so it would have like registers random access somewhere the the, the trick is. Uh, you should be able to virtualize it, right? Or, or, or make a model of the model of computation in the model of computation, like self-hosting compiler. Does that make sense? It makes sense, it just sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> Maybe the... Uh, Maybe the write, write, write a Turing machine simulator. How many people have written a Turing machine simulator? No one. Let's do that because th that's like so. So the key operation of the proof here was writing a Turing machine simulator in a Turing machine. Writing stuff for a Turing machine sucks. So write a Turing machine simulator in some language you like. Can, can we say groups of two or two or three? Let's do it in CSS. <laughs> if we can figure out how to do it in CSS, yes. My guess is uh, it's probably not possible in CSS. Is, is CSS Turing complete? Who likes CSS? 